Um, tonight, another reason why I'm so happy Philip is here is that he was my first professor when I was uh, a student of creative writing. Um, and so it's, it's just a special bond that we have. I am going to turn over the evening, however, to Kelly McMasters, who's in the um, English department as well, and she does is a nonfiction specialist. She also runs the um, publishing studies program, and she is going to informally introduce Philip Lopate, and then uh, he'll read for a little bit, and then they'll have a conversation, which will be followed by uh, questions from the audience, and at the end, they're some of Philip's books are for sale at the back. So, welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Michael. Like many writers, I feel like I've known Philip Lopate from afar, his star power, his reputation, as well as up close. His essays are of the most intimate kind, showing us ourselves by looking closely at himself. His work is seminal, his reach incredible. If I tried to recount his entire professional biography here in this introduction, we'd never get to his reading. So I'll just go for the shorthand, the way I describe him to my students who are approaching his work for the first time. He is necessary. He is required. He is our heartbeat. You simply cannot understand nonfiction without him. That said, he also writes poetry, fiction, and criticism. He's a phenomenal teacher, having taught in New York City public schools as well as undergraduate and graduate writing programs. He's been awarded a Guggenheim and two National Endowment for the Arts grants. He is also, as you'll find tonight, kind and funny. He's a great man with a great mind, and we are lucky to have him here with us tonight. Please help me welcome. Experience Necessary. Uh, it was written, uh, it was commissioned for a book of essays uh, by contemporary essayists using, um, taking off from an essay by Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, uh, the founder of the essays genre. And, uh, and I took uh, Montaigne's uh, essay on experience as my jumping off point. So it begins with a uh, it's, a, it's an essay in 17 sections. I'll just pause between sections. Um, and it begins with an epigram from Montaigne, from his essay of experience, which goes like this. There is nothing so beautiful and legitimate as to play the man well and properly. No knowledge so hard to acquire as the knowledge of how to live this life well and naturally. And the most barbarous of our maladies is to despise our being. Of Experience is Montaigne's last and I insist greatest essay. It inspires us with its wisdom and balance. Montaigne, like Goethe, had the knack, some would say the bad taste, of benefiting from his experience at every stage of life and achieving a calm, benign perspective with age, which I can't entirely seem to do. I am approaching my 70th birthday, three score and ten, the alleged fulfillment of a lifespan. I am still agitated, perplexed. I look back at all that has happened to me and it seems as though it were practically nothing. To quote the last line of Borges' poem on Emerson, I have not lived, I want to be someone else. <laughs> on the other hand, I want to be only myself. I think I know what I am about and comfortable with that person, can distinguish good writing from bad and decent human beings from jerks. Less and less do I feel the need to justify my conclusions. I carry myself in public with impervious self-confidence. In private is another story. My students look to me for answers and I improvise, something that passes for adequate. 
most of the dilemmas that shake these young people, their existential religious or romantic doubts, their future professional prospects, their worries that someone won't like them, roll off my back. It could be that I am just numbed, unable to summon the urgency behind what to them constitutes a crisis. Mine is a questionable wisdom of passivity. What I cannot change, I no longer let myself be insanely bothered by. Even the latest political folly elicits from me only a disgruntled shrug. I am more upset when my favorite sports team <coughs> loses. But then I remind myself that it wasn't technically my fault since I lacked magical powers to alter the outcome. Are you experienced, asked Jimi Hendrix, tauntingly. Does he mean, have I slept with 50 groupies, humped a guitar on stage before adulating thousands, taken so many drugs that I risk dying from an overdose? In that sense, no, I am not experienced. Otherwise, are you experienced? Hell yes, I know the score. I wasn't born yesterday. I've been around the block a few times. I can tell which way is up. You can't pull a fast one on me. You can't pull the wool over my eyes. I'm from Missouri, show me. I know a thing or two. I know which side my bread is buttered on. I'm hip. I'm sadder but wiser. I'm no fool. I have eyes in the back of my head. I can tell my left from my right. I know my ass from my elbow. I can see which way the wind blows. I have a pretty good idea. I've been through the mill. I've been around the world on a plane. I've seen it all. Now I've seen it all. <laughs> Detachment, writes the art historian Svetlana Alpers, is one of the forms that engagement with experience can take. Things seen that are remove, appearing strange, and so more clearly seen. End quote. Experience can mean plunging into dangerous war zones, witnessing tragedies under fire, like George Orwell at the Spanish Front and Susan Sontag in Bosnia. Or it can mean staying on the sidelines, exercising watchful prudence. Then there, then there is the experience of ordinary humdrum life, what Virginia Woolf calls cotton wool, those moments of non-being. Hey, bring it on. As Bartleby might say, I prefer not to live at the highest pitch. I've always been a fan of bemused detachment. I am rather attached to the notion of detachment. I accept in advance the guilt for being detached, should any such guilt attach. Of experience was, as I said, Montaigne's last essay. I wonder if this will be my last essay. I am running out of things to say. Moreover, I feel I have done my life's work as a writer. I have nothing more to prove. It is strange to have come to such a pass and be surrounded by friends and colleagues still pressing on, unsure whether they will have time enough to fulfill their appointed destinies. I have fulfilled a modest destiny modestly. I have done what I set out to do and now linger on past my assignment. I can still visit museums and relish new movies or old books, can still enjoy a walk through unfamiliar parts of the city, can still participate in the delights, follies, and chagrins of family life, can still teach the young and hold forth in AWP panel discussions, but I don't want to work so hard at writing anymore. It's as if I have a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. All those years trying to meet the challenge of writing well have left me trembling with a desire for peace and inactivity. There is an abundance of things I can't do now and so probably will never do. I can't change a tire to save my life. Although if it were a matter of life and death, perhaps I could. I can't read sheet music or play the piano. I used to be able to read Hebrew, but now I can't without committing lots of errors. I am a poor swimmer and can barely stay alive in the water. I don't run marathons, not because I couldn't physically speaking, but because I can't make myself run a marathon. What I can't do and what I don't care to do are connected at the hip. I don't know Latin. I can't tell one tree or flowering shrub from another. I am at a loss as how to identify the stars. In fact, my grasp of astronomy is so scant 
that I could say with Charles Lamb, quote, this is Lamb, I guess at Venus only by her brightness, and if the sun on some portentous morn were to make his first appearance in the West, I verily believe that while all the world were gasping in apprehension about me, I alone should stand unterrified from sheer incuriosity and want of observation. <laughs> My understanding of the way things work, including the laws of physics, is so pathetic, it's a wonder I can navigate the world at all. I specialize in ignorance. What do I know, as Miss Sheldon Montaigne would say? It looks as though I won't have sex with a man in this lifetime. <laughs> Experience has taught me to honor my indifference and my cowardice both. Put it this way, experience has finally proved to be a school that trains me to limit my concerns and tolerate my limitations. One privilege of growing older is that you do not have to adjust to the new or even get excited about it. I remain a man of the 20th century. Reluctantly dragged into the new millennium, I stay loyal to the previous one, hewing to the patterns I established then. For instance, I still read the print versions of newspapers and magazines and dress respectably when I take an airplane. I avoid thinking about Facebook, Twitter, or texting or any such innovations. Not that I deplore them. I have no high-minded objections to the new technology. I simply refuse to engage mentally with it. When I happen to glance at op-ed pieces about the evolutionary danger these new forms of communication pose to humanist values, I stop reading the article forthwith because I don't want to care enough about the phenomena even to be alarmed by them. I refuse to be topical. I am thus spared much wasted effort trying to write ingenious think pieces about the latest splash or gizmo. Experience has also taught me to recognize that much of what passes for innovation is simply puffery, the product of public relations and short memories. In pop or high culture, the edgy turns out usually to be the recycling of a tired trope. Take androgyny. Marlena Dietrich wore her tux and kissed a woman on the lips. Now Madonna or Lady Gaga does the same. Similarly, S&M and black leather, fragmentation, jettisoning of narrative, scrambling of chronology, self-reflexive loops, Artodian stage ritual, Klebnikovian nonsense syllables, neo dadaist anti-art, Brechtian Marxist alienation effects, and politically correct consciousness raising of all stripes. In my youth, I would read the pages of the New York Times Arts and Leisure section. It was called something different then, but no matter. With avid credulity, thinking I must make a point to catch up with this filmmaker, painter, opera conductor, or theater production. Now I scan the bylines, and knowing most of these arts journalists, whose opinions I don't particularly trust, nor do I value their pro styles, hardworking though they may be, I spend more time musing about how they got the assignment than reading through their articles. Does that sound really snotty or qualify as a sign of experience? I have experienced enough in the way of people's strange behaviors not to be surprised by sudden breakouts of kindness, brutality, tenderness, betrayal, inconsistency, vanity, rigidity, Schadenfreude, and its opposite. What does surprise me is current events. When 9-11 happened, I was taken aback by such a freakish thing. It was to me no accident that 9-11 occurred on the other side of the millennium in 2001. No good, I thought, can come of the 21st century. Not that the 20th did not have its share of nasty surprises. I continue to marvel at Republicans' seeming willingness to shut down the federal government and allow the United States to default rather than negotiate with the president. I don't understand my country anymore. How, after a century of federal programs such as the New Deal, Social Security, bank regulation, public housing, and food stamps, a large swath of the population can still take umbrage at the government's minimal efforts to protect the weak and the poor, or indeed, to have a presence in any aspect of life beyond the maintenance of a military force. Nothing prior has prepared me for this frightening swerve. I grew up in the post-war atmosphere of a modestly progressive welfare state 
where problems such as racial segregation and poverty were expected to be addressed at the governmental level. And I assumed naively that we were marching at best or creeping at worst toward a more just society. What I took for an inevitable historical progression turned out to be an anomalous blip. I might better have looked to Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence. Today, I am less experienced, less able to adapt to this harshly selfish environment than the average 20-year-old who has grown up without my New Deal Great Society set of expectations. Newspapers were once enormously important. Now they're not. I am a creature of newspaper culture. Therefore, I'm no longer important. I'm redundant. I must learn to accept my redundancy like to get your superfluous man. Fortunately, I've had plenty of practice. I always anticipated I would be redundant, a cultural throwback, which is why I prepared by steeping myself in the antiquarian tomes of ages past, whose authors' names I suspected would mean next to nothing in future generations. When my writer friends in college were reading Beckett, Burroughs, and Pynchon, I was poring over Fielding, Machado de Assis, and Lady Murasaki. Later, when I discovered the joys in the personal essay, I clung to the fustian charms of Charles Lamb, Hazlitt, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Max Beerbaum, with scarcely a side glance at David Sedaris, David Foster Wallace, and Sarah Vowell. I have cheerfully morphed into the type whose idea of a fun movie, as my teenage daughter scoffingly reminds me, is a restored black and white silent film. <laughs> so what good is experience if the experience I have managed to acquire no longer applies to the new era's challenges, except as the contrarian stiffening of my stubbornness in the face of novelty and the embrace of the antedated and rarefied. Ralph Waldo Emerson rebukes me. This is a quote from Circles. Emerson says, But the man and woman of 70 assume to know all. They have outlived their hope. They renounce aspiration, accept the actual for the necessary, and talk down to the young. Let them then become organs of the Holy Ghost. Let them be lovers. Let them behold truth, and their eyes are uplifted, their wrinkles smooth. They are perfumed again with hope and power. This old age ought not to creep on a human mind. In nature, every moment is new. The past is always swallowed and forgotten. The coming only is sacred. Nothing is secure but life, transition, the energizing spirit. People wish to be settled only as far as they are unsettled. Is there any hope for them? That's Emerson's quote. Yeah, yeah, so you say. <laughs> I do wish to be settled. Perhaps I have outlived my hope. When Emerson wrote this passage, it must have sounded fresh, rebellious, positively electric. Now it sounds dated. I realize that even in choosing to let Ralph Waldo Emerson rebuke me, I am indulging in an antiquarian longing. These are the last six lines of that beautiful Borges poem about Emerson. He thinks, I have read the essential books and written others which oblivion will not efface. I have been allowed that which has given mortal man to know. The whole continent knows my name. I have not lived. I want to be someone else. Well, the whole continent does not know my name, but I am respected. I have read a good many essential books, alas, forgetting most of what was in them, so that I find I have to read them again from scratch and have written more than a dozen books which, if not guaranteed to escape oblivion, have given some pleasure to some readers. More than that, I will not, I must not ask. The gods get angry at ingratitude. I am not grandiose enough, like Emerson or Borges, to think it even my place to want to be someone else. This reminds me of the old Jewish joke. The rabbi and the synagogue bigwigs are beating their breasts on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and crying out, I'm a worm, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. The janitor, a goy, decides it looks like a good idea and starts beating his chest too and moaning, I'm nobody, I'm nobody. They stare at him with alarm disdain until one of them says, look who thinks he's nobody. <laughs> so who am I to think myself a nobody, a failure, when the planet itself is slinking off to darkness and extinction 
for mankind's sheer incapacity to correct its gluttony. What is the nature of experience? What is the connection, if any, between experience and knowledge? What is the relationship between knowledge and wisdom? Can one acquire wisdom passively? Can one live and not acquire experience? Is experience only experience if it has been converted into self-conscious thought? Or do we count the unconscious in our stock of experience? Our dreams, for instance, are they not part of our experience? By the way, is there really such a thing as the unconscious? Is wisdom principally an intellectual or an emotional property? Can wisdom bypass the heart and lodge only in the brain, or does it ever work vice versa? What is the difference in value between a shady experience consciously undertaken and one prudently avoided? Does prudence, meaning the wise avoidance of certain sketchy paths, result in a shallower or deeper soul? Is there even such a thing as a soul? If not, what is the point of gaining experience? Here's another quote from Montaigne. We are great fools. He has spent his life in idleness, we say. I have not, I've done nothing today. What, have you not lived? That is not only the fundamental, but the most illustrious of your occupations. You think, if I had been placed in a position to manage great affairs, I would have shown what I could do. Have you been able to think out and manage your own life? You've done the greatest task of all. To compose our character is our duty, not to compose books, and to win not battles and provinces, but order and tranquility in our conduct. Our great and glorious masterpiece is to live appropriately. So said Montaigne, who wrote of experience at 56 and died when he was 59. We'll say 60 for the sake of rounded numbers. Since 70 is a new 60, I should be reaching that point of ripe wisdom that Montaigne attained at the end of his life. No? But since the average young person today has so protracted an adolescence compared to a youth in 16th century France, see Philip Arias' Centuries of Childhood, which demonstrated that children were treated as little adults and expected to work from age seven on, we would have to subtract an additional 20 years from my maturity index bringing me down to age 40. Then take another 10 years off for the syndrome that Hemingway contemptuously called the American boy man, meaning that there was something uniquely arrested development about the males in this particular land, which would reduce my emotional age even further. So I should probably be considered the equivalent of a 30 year old. No wonder I am still blinking my eyes like a hatched chick and pondering what's what. The problem of solipsism, not believing that others are as real as you are, would seem to put a lid on acquiring wisdom. On the other hand, maybe we are all narcissists, and if narcissism proves to be the universal law, then we need to re-examine all the high-minded in vain against narcissism and ask if it is a hypocritical form of social coercion. Why should we feel guilty about something we cannot avoid? I don't think I'm really a narcissist of the first order. Unlike Montaigne, I'm not even terribly interested in myself. When I'm alone in my study or walking the streets, I'm usually thinking not about me but about other people, trying to figure them out. Though that could just be another form of narcissistic self-protection, trying to anticipate what they might do so as to parry it effectively when the situation arises. In any case, I am something of a literalist when it comes to reality. I assume that the people around me are real, that tree outside my window is real, etc. I have never understood that notion put forward by Jean Baudrillard or David Shields that we less and less feel our lives to be real, that the simulacra incessantly produced by the media have robbed us of the sense of our own authenticity and therefore we hunger for the real. I don't hunger for the real. I don't have the foggiest notion what that means. I just want to get by. I just want to enjoy what years are left to me on earth, and most of all, I want to watch my daughter Lily turn into the amazing adult she is fast becoming. I want to watch her embrace her full potential and her destiny. I worry about her fretting too much. Amor fati, I want to tell her, that's Latin, meaning love your fate. 
which I also tell myself constantly for all the good it does. I wake up between 6 and 6.30 each morning having to pee. My cats notice about me and begin to rummage about the bed at that hour to make sure I will get up and feed them. I put glaucoma controlling drops in my eyes the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night. I have no problem dropping off to sleep, but I wake up in the night more often than I used to, sometimes roused by noisy neighbors, sometimes by snoring, mine or my wife's, sometimes by dream, or for no discernible reason whatsoever. I wake up and start picking my nose to clear the breathing passageways. This is particularly true in winter when the heat goes on at night and dries out the bedroom air. Because I don't get enough sleep, in the late afternoon I find my eyes drooping when I read. And many times when I'm at the movies or listening to an opera, I start nodding off. It's outrageous to pay so much for opera tickets and then doze, but I can't help myself. Sometimes, just to keep awake, I rub my scalp above the forehead where there used to be hair. And often I find scabs or bumps that I try to smooth out by picking off the indentations. When I am in a public place such as the subway or at the movies, I am always worrying about bed bugs latching on to me. Ever since we had an infestation of them a few years back and had to take extreme measures to rid ourselves, hauling all our clothing off to the dry cleaners and wrapping the books, Every time my skin itches, I think it must be bed bugs returning. I hate to lie and will do almost anything to avoid telling a lie, even if it means sneaking out of a poetry reading the moment it's over. <laughs> <laughs> or if directly accosted, blurting out something undiplomatic and giving offense. This resistance to lying stems not so much from an ethical principle as a superstitious dread, as though if I ever started to lie glibly, my coarse self would dissolve and I would become a creature of multiple personalities. When you lie, you split yourself into two selves and then a third self has to keep watch and adjudicate the first two. Hence, adultery has never been much of an option for me. <laughs> of course, I have lied on some occasions, but I am not going to tell you where or when. That experienced I am. Most of my lies are sins of omission, like keeping my mouth shut when I could get in trouble by saying what I actually thought. If someone tells me that he loved a movie I found abysmal, I smile and nod enthusiastically, though with a slight catch of the head, so that if God is watching, he will understand and forgive my deception. <laughs> Why should we be transparent, though? Is art transparent? Better to honor the mysteries. There is so much we will never be able to understand that we do not need to go in search of mystery. It will come to us regardless. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Are these on? Okay, great. I think you just have to pick it up. It's already on. Okay. <laughs> In your experience. Um, <laughs> thank you. That was wonderful. I actually um, heard you, I got to hear you read that at AWP, uh, and um, it was even better this time. Um, and one of my questions, this is the perfect essay because one of my questions has to do with the lists and um, the arithmetic that goes on in that essay, the lists of questions, unanswered questions. Uh, in an interview from Harper's Magazine, you said, I often start out in a place that feels like a baffling cul-de-sac. I think, how did I get here? What's going on? I can't start out in a self-pleased place because then there's no tension. There's no place for the essay to go. And I wondered, uh, one of the students was hoping for some advice that you might have for young writers who are trying to figure out how to take their thoughts from that baffling cul-de-sac to a concise essay. Well, one thing I did in this essay was I divided it up into small units so I could control it better. Uh, and then I, then I played around with some of it, like the, 
the, the section that's all cliches mm -hmm. or the section that's all questions. Um, and uh, I was able to mix in some literary references at times and then some stuff that is so mundane, you know. Um, to, so um, when I write something, I'm, I'm, I'm not just thinking of what I'm writing, but I'm also thinking about the whole tradition of the essay and, um, and I'm piggybacking on it, you know. So um, it's not like I have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, there are some great essays on experience, not just Montaigne's, but um, Emerson has a great essay on experience. Uh, so, um, so I was, I, I thought, in a way I thought, this is ridiculous. How can you write an essay on experience? It's just too big a topic, uh, too shapeless. Uh, so then I tried to, you know, cough some pieces uh, off of the marble, you know. Um, and so in a way, um, there's a kind of comedy underneath it, like, you know, you can't really write an essay about experience. Um, so the, I'm playing with that in a way. So for me, uh, when, I get, when, I, when I start to feel baffled, I try to reach for something mischievous, you know. Uh, I try to do mischief. Um, and, and, and that keeps me going. It really does. Uh, if, I can, if I can laugh at, at some, something, then, you know, I think, okay, this is not going to be so terrible. In that essay, you also mentioned Lily, your daughter. Yes. Um, and in other essays, especially essays that we read for tonight, you often write of your students. Um, in one of my favorite essays of yours, Suicide of a School Teacher, you write beautifully about um, a colleague who commits suicide and the, the teacher surrounding that colleague. Lily, of course, children change things. Uh, the way you talk in this essay, the way that you live, and the way you see the world changes. And they also change the way we write. Um, one of the main questions that I get over and over in my classrooms are, but what about the people we're writing about? How do we protect them, but still do our job as artists, as writers? Um, you have uh, many, many amazing essays where I think, I'm so happy that he wrote that, but oh my gosh, how would that person feel? <laughs> and I wonder how, that, how you work out what those lines are that you draw for yourself. I, I know you can't draw lines for other people, but what are your lines? Well, I have this, uh, this short essay on the ethics of, of writing about others. Should mm -hmm. I read that? You know, or do you think I should just paraphrase? Um, Maybe paraphrase. Well, you know, first of all, I don't, I don't have... Uh, I don't have an answer for other people, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a one-size-fits-all answer. And I have to decide it each time, uh, anew. Um, and so the short answer is I just, I, I write about what's important and, and accept the guilt. Um, and I say in this that, you know, it's, it's a good idea to make lots of friends because you're going to lose some. And also to be born into a large family. You know. <laughs> and the third recommendation I make is to, um, to only write about people who are too poor to sue you. That's very important. Um, but, but seriously, I do think that, um, that it's, it's a question that, uh, that doesn't go away, won't go away. Um, you know, Thomas Hardy wrote a lot of beautiful love poems to women he had crushes on. And his, his two wives read them, you know. Uh, got him in a lot of trouble. Anyway, um, but they were important for him to write. Uh, so uh, I used to fool myself and think, well, I'll write this and then I'll put it in a drawer. I won't do any, anything with it, but this is just for me, a secret writing. And then if it turned out well, I think, oh, well, the heck with that. I'm going to publish it. So um, I, I, do, I do think that uh, this will sound like a rationalization, but in a way you are giving the people you're writing about something, you're giving them, the, you know, um, you're communicating with them what you actually think and feel. And I think if you can write about other people without vindictiveness, without a vendetta, without revenge, um, and try at least partly to understand 
their side, you know, um, then I think you have the right to, to write about other people. Um, I mean, obviously, fiction writers say, oh, well, I'm just going to disguise everything, you know. The problem is that usually the people know when they're being disguised, you know. Um, they get just as angry at you. Um, so, um, so I just think, you know, being alive is potentially hurting others, you know. Um, but, you know, you, you do the best you can. Well, sometimes you put other people in the spotlight, but more often than not, you put yourself in the spotlight. Yes. And in Against Joy de Vivre, you say, quote, I distrust anything which will make me pause long enough to be put in touch with my helplessness. And I wonder, how do you become brave enough to admit, face, and live within that helplessness, and then to expose it to your readers? Well, I don't have an option. I have to, I, I will at times be helpless, you know, and that's just, uh, that's true for everyone. Um, I, I mean, I think that uh, that being honest is a two-step process. I mean, I, I have to, I have to search uh, my thoughts all the time to think, what is going on here? What was I doing then? Why am I doing this? Um, and and then on the other hand, I have to turn myself into a character, and so that when I write about myself, I don't feel so vulnerable. I think, well, that's that guy. You know, I've made myself into a character. I don't, I don't, I don't feel exposed because I, I'm, I'm aware of the artifice involved, and even the shaping of each sentence. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're not, you're not taking your clothes off in public. You're just, you're just thinking, and you're thinking about things that, if you're, if you're humble enough, you know, other people have thought as well. I'm not having, you know, the first person to have this thought. So um, I'm just trying to understand the way I operate, and then to transmit it into shapely sentences which other people can read and, and some will identify with. When did you know how to do that though? When in your writing life, I mean, did you, when you first came to nonfiction and you first started writing essay, did that come naturally to you or is it easier now? How can you describe that a little? Or was it harder in certain parts of your life, during your life? I think it was a form that I, that I was really born to write. Um, I, I had always liked uh, fiction, where there were, I'd always liked first person fiction. And I'd always liked first person fiction that, um, that had a, a strong confiding voice. Um, and that's true even of poetry, even things like My Last Duchess by Browning. I liked this voice, somebody who was taking risks, you know. Um, so um, that's just a, that's just a a preference. I like the warmth that can come through an articulate first person, you know. Um, and then I've always had, as I said in this piece, uh, a propensity for detachment. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I didn't feel my life was on the line somehow, you know. Um, but really, I, I wrote I wrote fiction and poetry before I came to nonfiction, mm -hmm. um, and and it seemed to it seemed to me a form that I could use some of the elements of poetry, like, like jumping around, free associating, and, 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 and keep those elements of fiction which were character and, and story, narrative. So I was able to, to combine those two threads, essentially. Um, but, you know, it certainly, it certainly, I guess it has gotten easier. That's a problem because if it gets too easy, then, then you, you get bored and you think, well, I've written this essay already, you know. So you have to keep you have to keep um, setting new challenges. But I, I will admit that at this point in my life, I have the feeling that I can figure out some way of putting it across, you know? Some trick, something. Uh, so, so yes, in that sense, it has gotten easier. Well, I'm thinking back to when you first started writing or looking at the students that you teach now, um, are there or as one student wrote, what are the greatest mistakes that young writers make when they try to use their own life experiences in their writing? Do you see sort of hallmark mistakes of a new personal essayist? Well, sure. I mean, I think that, that um, the biggest mistake is self-righteousness. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's uh, nephew defensiveness, you know. 
and somehow the idea that um, trying to confusing, uh, you know, defending one's life with putting, with creating an artifact, um, and 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 with that I would say um, solemnity in general. Uh, so sometimes I read student works and it's as though there's a there's a stone sitting on the student's chest, and I just want them to to not take themselves so seriously or to have a little more fun with it or um, just be a little more worldly. I think that, that that is certainly, I don't know if you would call it a mistake, but an inevitable stage of development, which is that, uh, you know, if, if you're young and you don't, haven't experienced much or uh, haven't been exposed to much, you're bound to be a little unworldly. So you may be shocked at something that you, later on you'll realize, what was so shocking about that? Everybody knows that. So, um, so, so part of what you may have to do when you're first beginning is is to bluff more more worldliness than you than you really have. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that often, and it's not only just age, but with with young writers, sometimes they bluster in a different way on the page to make up for for sort of giving them permission to write something about themselves. Right. And you right. often hear in today and you know, about memoir and the age of memoirists and are they too young? What do they have to tell us? Right. Um, and I think sometimes there's a confidence issue, but I see that regardless of age with writers who are coming to nonfiction, there's, there's less space to hide on the page, it seems. Which yes, is absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, some, sometimes uh, students will, um, they'll simply be evasive, you know. They, and sometimes they'll scramble the chronology unnecessarily because they're just afraid of, uh, you know, being straightforward. Um, so, um, so there's a kind of shame underneath it. Like, do I really uh, have the right to, to tell this, you know? Um, and, and that's why they have to figure out ways of having fun with it. Now, here's a question that I still um, struggle with. Creative nonfiction, literary nonfiction. Um, I know where you stand, but maybe that, that's a big question in the classroom for new students coming. Why, why is it nonfiction? Why can't we call it something else? And then what is creative nonfiction versus literary nonfiction? Well, what, what would be the alternative to nonfiction? What, what would they want to call it? Prose? <laughs> I, nobody in my classroom has ever come up with a better answer. I think that's why we get stuck with a being defined by what we're not, um, but... I know, it's like the uncola, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, or the antichrist or something like that. Oh, but um, I, I, I have a very good reason for supporting the term nonfiction, which is that uh, I'm a careerist and, I, and it helps me get a paycheck to um, say that I'm a nonfiction writer. Um, but um, the, I'm being euphemistic in a way, but... Um, I prefer the term literary nonfiction just because it, um, it it speaks to the art of it speaks to the artifact. Creative nonfiction seems to me like you're patting yourself on the back, and and nobody sets out to write uncreative nonfiction. You know? um, so, um, you know, Robert Frost said, "You shouldn't call yourself a poet. Let other people call you that you're a poet." Um, so, but I think that basically. Uh, there is this tradition. If you call it, if you call it, you can't call it autobiographical prose because there's a lot of non-autobiographical prose. Mm -hmm. It's nonfiction. Um, mm -hmm. So, for me, the reason why I'm drawn to literary nonfiction, even though one could say it's another way of patting yourself on the back, is that you know I'm I'm in love with this idea that that there are these centuries that this is not something new. You know, I feel like there's something disingenuous about. It's acting like the memoir is this new form, you know. So, so I like the idea of, uh, of um, alluding to the shadow of tradition. I like that too. <laughs> um, I was speaking to the essayist Lena Ferreira recently, yeah. who wrote a gorgeous piece on cannibalism for the same Montaigne anthology that you just read that piece from. Um, and I asked her if she, because she sat on that panel with you, and I asked her if she had any recommendations for questions. And she suggested I ask you something simple, like your favorite color. No, don't have it. <laughs> I love that but, green, though. That's very oh, nice. thank you. Thank you. Um, but I was thinking about Lena, and she, Lena Ferreira just won 
a Rona Jaffe Award. Right. Uh, Leslie Jameson just started teaching with you at Columbia. Yes. Elena Passarello won a Whiting last year, and she's burning up the West Coast. Um, why this appetite for a strong, younger female voice right now in the world of essays? You know, the, 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 the essay is, the essay used to be a male province, you know, and, and, and there were women writers obviously going back to at least, you know, Afrobane or, and, and, and through the 18th century, but they were mostly writing uh, novels, plays, and letters. Mm -hmm. And they were not writing essays. And the essay, the, the male essays were very often uh, ridiculing themselves and calling themselves um, uh, outsiders, non-players, idlers, and so on. But they were doing it in such a way that was drawing on a lot of easy authority. Mm -hmm. So something that was harder for women to assert. Um, but, you know, we've seen um, so many powerful women essayists in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. You know, people like Susan Sontag and Mary McCarthy and so on. Simone Weil. Um, so I think that um, obviously, you know, the feminist movement gave a certain amount of permission to talk about uh, uh, one's body, one's, one's uh, relations to men, you know, um, to talk about, for one of a better word, vulnerable subjects. Um, so essentially, um, women have really moved into the area, you know, some of the strongest uh, essayist now women, mm -hmm. really. And, you know, um, a friend of mine, Lynn, Lynn Free, just sent me her new book. It's just beautiful. Um, Emily Fox Gordon, you know, there's so many. Um, and, um, and I think, curiously enough, they're, they're undefensive. And you might say men are now on the defensive. Mm -hmm. So they're not sure. How, men are not sure how to, um, how to speak without offending. Mm -hmm. I, of course, am shameless, so I don't have this problem. <laughs> well, so much of nonfiction is about vulnerability. It sounds like maybe you're saying we're at a place where women feel more protected and so they can be more vulnerable on the page. Well, they can stage their vulnerability. Let's, let's get it clear. Um, yes, vulnerable, but once you make it into an artifact, it's much less vulnerable. Yeah. It's, it, it's that thing, it's not you anymore. It's that bowl, that piece of pottery, you know. You've shaped it. Yeah. Right. I think that's also for a young essay, it's coming to the form, the, one of the most important things to understand that it's not yourself on the page. And you talk so beautifully about that in your book um, on creative, on nonfiction, but also um, in the essay on creating a, yourself as a character. Um, and thinking about, well, you direct the nonfiction part of an MFA program, but thinking about the MFA programs in general right now, as we sort of bring these new hopeful writers, young or old, to mm -hmm. classrooms and talk about writing and talk about the writing community at large, um, you know, there's a discussion about the MFA crisis right now. When you think about how to best structure MFA programs to teach, teach people writing, because I think you do believe it is teachable, um, if, if, if I read your essays correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what do you think is the most important thing we can do right now, moving, looking at the next 10, 20 years in an MFA, MFA program in particular? Well, what I've tried to do at Columbia is to, is to add a lot of courses like science writing, criticism or master classes in food writing, environmental writing, um, and, and, and to, to get this, let's say a student enters um, writing a memoir, writing personal essays, I want them to be able to leave, able to do more than one thing. I want them to be able to research, um, and I want, I want them to be able to move between different um, subject matters, you know, because um, I want them to be able to make a living, you know, and if they're just going to uh, write about their experience, you know, sorry, that's me. Probably my daughter. Hold on a second. You should answer it. <laughs> Nonfiction. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so 
let's look at nonfiction as a big tent. And, and, um, and I myself, you know, have, have been writing a lot of criticism recently. Uh, but, I, but I see criticism as a uh, demonstration of personality just as much as a personal essay is. Mm -hmm. You know, when, if we read um, Lionel Trilling or Edmund Wilson or Susan Sontag, they may never use the word I, but you still feel very strongly that they've, that they, they've created a voice and a personality on the page. So, um, so I just want to, uh, to broaden the idea of nonfiction. I taught a course in, in, in continental uh, essay, I call it, but I was, it involved also teaching, uh, in that course, uh, I started out with, with um, Seneca and Cicero, and I went to Leia Party, and uh, Nietzsche and Freud, and Walter Benjamin, and Susan Sontag, and so on. So I was, it involved some philosophy, because philosophy is also a kind of Adorno, you know, it's also a kind of uh, nonfiction, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking to expand the intellectual reach of nonfiction, you know, uh, because it's wonderful when students realize that they, they don't only have to, they can write about themselves, but they can also use a kind of Roland Barth um, uh, generalization or aphorism, you know, uh, which, which, which goes beyond just their personal experience to something larger, you know. So for me, um, so part of the answer is I'd like, I'd like it to be more intellectually rigorous, and part of it is I'd like it to be more various. I and also more, and also, as I say, more, more, more involved with the tradition so that they're not just learning how to write in the way it's, if you learn how to write in the 2017 way, by the time it's 2018, it's already old hat, you know. <laughs> so you might as well, you know, go back to Cicero. Yeah, yeah. And that'll be new again. Um, I think we're, we just have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so maybe as, as, if anybody wants to ask, you can come up to the mic here. But I wanted to return to, um, to that uh, question. I would like to, well, if you can't answer now, I would hope that you would, now, oh, is it teaching? Is it teaching well? Oh no, I was I was going to go back to your favorite color because I think oh. that would I would love to see an essay by you on your favorite color. Yeah, I don't have a favorite color, but I will say I will <laughs> say this essay. about uh, I. It's not that I think that you can teach mm. someone to be a writer. It's that I think you can do something um, parallel to them, and and it's a, and you can form a relationship, you know, which is what teaching is. It's a relationship. Mm. And, and, and what happens is, what I've observed in, 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 in MFA programs is that my students get better as writers. Am I teaching them to write? I don't know. But I'm, but I'm, uh, I'm throwing lots of stuff at them, uh, and they're taking what they can, or maybe they would have gotten better just in the course of those two years, even without that. But something is happening, you know? It's not systematic. Um, but, but, you know, and some of it may be, you know, one learns a lot from a teacher that has nothing to do with what that teacher is saying. Body language, uh, just, the, just the example of seeing them uh, persist when maybe they're down or something like that, you know, or, 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 or see them being uncertain, anything, you know. So you're learning the other person, you know. You're going to school for, for um, you know, studying the teachers as human beings as well as, what they're trying to teach you. No favorite colors, sorry. <laughs> Not yet. Somebody better do. That. Thank you, um, Philip. You, you've you've talked um, at some length about the fact that um, in writing um, an essay, you a, a personal essay, um, a literary essay, what call it what you will, that you are creating in some sense a character. Uh, you are, in another way, um, performing. 
Is the character that you create in the essay um, different from the you that is? Um, is there a gap, in fact, in the narrative voice you employ and the person who is Philip Lope? And well, certainly. I mean, it, it is more... Um, it and is, what is the difference? Uh, the, the, the Philip Lope on the page is much more articulate than I am. Um, uh, on, you know, like, when I wake up in the morning, you know, it's like, boo, boo, boo. You know, I'm not... I'm not um, I'm not being so articulate, you know. Um, let me turn this over again. Um, uh, so, um, so for one thing, it is you know it is more. It comes from from my sitting there and eventually being able to hear the voice in my head that is that is talking in a syntactically orderly fashion, which is not the way that thoughts rush through your mind. I mean. Donald Trump never had that experience. He just, you know, he is still talking with the thoughts rushing to his mind. But, uh, but I insist on waiting a little bit for them to be more syntactically ordered. Um, so, um, so that's one thing. And then um, each essay is a slightly different persona. So um, if I'm writing, which partly is determined by who am I writing this for? You know, every magazine has its own house style. So if I'm writing it for a magazine, uh, I'm, I'm, however consciously or unconsciously, giving it to that audience, you know. Um, if I'm writing a, a piece for a film magazine, I'm going to assume a certain amount of knowledge of film history. Um, so, but not if I'm writing it for a general readership, you know. Uh, so, so that's part of it. And then there are times when I'll write something that's very outrageous or contrarian, and other times I'll be very reasonable and sweet, you know. So, um, so I really, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just working with different, different selves, different slivers of self in a way. Um, so, so the real Philip Lopez is both, um, is more complicated and more inarticulate. But you don't see that construction as a lie. You've already outed yourself as a bad lie. I don't see it as a lie. I mean, I think this, I'm, the fact that, the fact that nonfiction is a, is a fabricate is a is fabricated doesn't necessarily mean that it's fiction. I do maintain that there's a difference between fiction and nonfiction. Uh, the fact that we make it doesn't mean that it's that it's fiction. Uh, or you could go in the other direction. Uh, the fact that that fiction draws heavily on on the real doesn't make it nonfiction. So some of this has to do with with intention, you know, uh, you know, Duchamp submitted a urinal, signed it all month, and said it was art. You know, so uh, I'm not submitting urinals, but I am, um, I am asserting that what I'm doing is an essay or nonfiction. Any other questions? I gave a lot of thought to, to what socks I would wear tonight. Yeah. Um, and I hope it was the right choice. Philip, uh, oh, that's really loud. Thank you. Um, I think I know the answer, but I want to ask it anyway. Uh, I, I read uh, your essay on, on Joie de Vivre, and I think the, at the summary of it at the end is, is something to the effect that uh, you say, I think it's hypocritical to pretend satisfaction while I'm still hungry. Right. And so my question to you is, um, are you still hungry? What will satisfy you? When will you no longer be hungry as a writer? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, um, I think I've reached a point where, where, where I'm content um, with my lot or, you know, with my teaching and with my writing. And, and, um, and, and I don't beat myself up as much anymore. With, is, this, is this all there is or is there some... Is there some happiness that I'm missing out on, you know? I mean, it was, it was a great relief to me when I decided that I would never be purely happy. Um, and, and, and um, you know, and from then on, you know, I, I, I made a lot of progress. Um, and I do think it's a kind of a difference, one of the differences between uh, the United States l literature and other countries. You know, if you, read, uh, if you read a Japanese novel, 
Um, you know, if you read an American novel, especially written, uh, you know, during, all through the 20th century, the, the character would, the hero or heroine would, would, would be in pursuit of happiness. And then if it was a serious, if it was an unserious uh, thing, they would get it. And if it was serious, there would just there would be an unhappy ending. But, um, but if you read a Japanese novel from the same period, the, the character would assume from the beginning that he was going to be unhappy and then get on with it, you know? So um, it isn't that I've, it isn't that I've um, accepted being unhappy, it's that I've accepted um, my, my portion of content. Um, and, and so it isn't so much that I'm hungry as that, um, and, and I, I actually felt that when I wrote it in, 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 in the experience essay. And by the way, I've written many essays since then. Um, so it wasn't to be my last essay, but um, but I did feel like okay, I've done I've said what I, I've done what I wanted to do. I've written the books I want to write, and anything beyond that is lagging up or however you say that word. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I so um, so I would say I would say contented, yes. Not the answer I expected. Thank you. <laughs> Not the answer you expected. Good, I'm glad to have surprised you. <laughs> well, Philip Lope, thank you so much for returning to Hofstra. Thank you, Kelly. Next time we do this, uh, I want you to talk as much as I have.